2020. New year, new decade, new challenges for central banks. Not that they've not had some in the past decade, managing the recovery from the financial crisis. But now they're facing new, new issues that are coming onto their agenda, like tackling climate change, the, the emergence of digital currencies, the uh, entrance of tech companies also in their sphere, investment wars, trade wars, geopolitical tensions, and are they well prepared to manage the next downturn? We look forward to this discussion. And starting with you, Pierre, what do you think the new decade will bring for central banks? What are the challenges that they will be most focused on and how well prepared are they to deal with them? Well, I guess there are many and hopefully they are, they are prepared. Uh, uh, if, you, if you look at what uh, link all those uh, central banks, I guess to a large extent is uh, how to deal with the post QE. What, uh, what does it mean in terms of managing the exit? I think it's been a debate for since 2013 actually, but we are still in this in this topic, which means uh, how to normalize interest rates if you want to do so, how do you deal with the size of those balance sheets. It wasn't and as smooth as they expected uh, yeah. to, to be still in that same place now after so long. I guess, you know, the, the fair assumption is that those balance sheets will stay maybe in not exact size, but a very significant size for, uh, for the foreseeable future. But I, but I think there's another, uh, maybe more short-term aspect and more a question actually for investors as well, which is are central bank uh, recession adverse? Are they worried about recession? Are they able to deal with those, which is a fairly you know, quarter on quarter topic. And if you look at 2019, uh, uh, it seems like, yes, they are fairly recession adverse, uh, maybe for different reasons in the US or in the Eurozone or even in the UK or in Japan, but overall, uh, the response from central bank has been uh, quite significant and uh, to such an extent that when you look at returns in uh, most asset classes on the back of it to a very large extent uh, this was a you know an extraordinary year so uh, i think you have some classic challenges which are how to deal with monetary policy but you also have maybe less classic challenges which is how do we Manage, how do we manage those recessions or if there's going to be any, what is the reaction that uh, we, can, we can think of? And we are in that space in the cycle where there is very high expectations that it is nearing the end. Of course, it hasn't happened yet, but there is a strong expectation. So this will be very relevant for the new decade. But zooming a bit more on Europe. So, Patrick, you headed one of uh, the euro area's central banks, the Central Bank of Ireland. How does it look from your perspective where Europe is now? What are the challenges for the ECB and the national central banks? We heard about uh, the potential of a recession, what tools they may have. But also there is a lot of uh, issues still with the euro. It's now in its third decade, having spent a decade of um, rising uh, divergences, a decade of crisis, and now trying to find its place, how do we actually complete the economic and monetary union? You know, I, I think and it's for all central banks, but especially for the euro area and the ECB now, it, it's both a challenge of effectiveness, delivering on the mandate, and also a, a challenge of public support, because the uh, support for the ECB was eroded in the course of the crisis. Now we have a new leadership, uh, again after Mario Draghi, a new leadership there, not just uh, the president, several members of the executive board, many members of the governing council. There's a huge turnover in the leadership of, of the ECB. And if we stop back and think of the other four biggest central banks, um, only one of them doesn't have a leadership change in, in very recent times. In China, uh, in the United States, and in, in a few weeks in, uh, here, here in Britain. So we, we'll see perhaps a new style of central banking and they will have to address these issues of effectiveness, and public support. And that will mean perhaps a, a different uh, mix of tools, a slightly change, slight change in, the, in emphasis. The ECB is looking at an, an, uh, the first look for uh, 17 years of its overall monetary policy strategy. Strategic review that is coming up. Yes. What do you expect to see in that? And also you spoke about leadership. It's also uh, a rare occasion where we don't have a, an economist at the helm of a central bank. Of course, in the States, we also have the same, but that is also perhaps a mark of this change of what central banks mean, how their role against governments or against other institutions may evolve. Well, perhaps, but there have been uh, often lawyers and non-economists heading central banks. Central banks are never short of economists. There are plenty of economists at the ECB, plenty of economists at the Federal Reserve and at, at all the other central banks. Um, the review of monetary policy at the ECB, I think if I was doing it, 
uh, I would be looking at the points of friction that have arisen since the last review, one of them being the issue of the asymmetric, uh, uh, it's the only central bank with that kind of asymmetric target uh, below but close to 2% in the medium term for the, for the inflation rate. Yeah, but below it, how far below and what does close mean? That has caused problems and I think that's something that they will definitely look at. I think another issue will be after this long period of undershoot of the target, which has accumulated, uh, the question rises is to what extent should the ECB be thinking of compensating on the upside? That's not explicit. That goes into the question of credibility and trust in terms of not uh, achieving the target. Because uh, because, uh, businesses make their plans on the basis of uh, achieving a a goal for the inflation rate, which has not been achieved for quite a number of years now, and the accumulated uh, gap is, is substantial. And of course, it's uh, marrying also all these different uh, views within the ECB from very national central banks. But turning to you, Barnabas, you're um, from the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, the Hungarian central bank, not in the euro, but uh, an ECB watcher for sure, and also looking at the monetary union. How does it look from the outside, from your perspective, all these efforts that we're seeing in the euro area in terms of reforming the economic and monetary union? And how would you react to what we've heard already about the challenges for central banks? Yeah, you are absolutely right that uh, we are outside the eurozone and we are in a wait and see position nowadays when to join to the to the euro area. Uh, so it's clear that uh, nowadays the euro project is an unf- unfinished project. So uh, several several steps are needed in the future. But I I would like to emphasize that uh, during the last decade, uh, uh, a huge progress uh, was made in that field. So I think many new institution. Uh, were, were built up within the eurozone, but of course the, the basic question is still that can be a monetary union successful without a fiscal union? So, so that's the uh, that's the base question still. That's now. a key question for what we expect uh, to see in the new decade. It's a it's a big if if we if the euro area mo- will move in that direction. Yeah, and 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 if you look at the answers, um, I think uh, as soon as this fiscal union the. The debt burden issues are, are raising in the tables. Uh, a heated debate is starting within the within the member states. So, so I think uh, a little bit slow uh, progress will come in that field in the in the in the near future. And the other issue is the is the coordination between the monetary policy and the fiscal policy within the eurozone. So I think that's the key lesson from the last crisis that. Uh, if you want to see uh, a successful crisis management in a country or in a region, or in the, if you want to see stronger rebound in a in real economic performance, you need uh, stronger coordination between the fiscal and, and monetary side. And I think uh, that part is still missing uh, from the crisis management toolkit uh, within the Eurozone. Uh, I'm, I'm quite wondering how the uh, European policymakers uh, uh, will change their mind in, 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 in the fiscal side. So, so I think that's the key. Yeah, it takes it back to the core challenge of how do you coordinate so many different national policies uh, with, a, with a currency that is shared. But taking it back to you, Pierre, and what does this all mean for investment? Because central banks, they have the role as policy makers that we've been talking about, the role as supervisors, but also they manage uh, foreign exchange reserves around the world. There's also other public investors that are very much uh, affected by the policies of central banks in terms of the investment environment. So how do you see trends in reserves management in that context? So I think there are, there are, there are really uh, two aspects. One is maybe in the long term, topics around you know climate change, topics around technology, inequality. So this is important for investors today if they want to make plans for the future. Mm. And, and of course, Amundi has focused a lot on ESG and climate change and investment with the IFC and others in terms of your investments in that area. Yeah, definitely. And we think we think it's key. It's key not only for our uh, f- fund holders, I'd say, but uh, and for us as a, as a company, probably, uh, to be responsible in that sense. But also because if you undermine uh, not only the environment but the overall system, uh, it's, it's going to bring you know financial instability. So even for central banks, I think it's a topic. Then the question is: Is it uh, as a regulator that you need to think about it, or is it even more like you know uh, uh, incentivizing you know uh, agents uh, in one particular di- direction? Even on topics like inequality, we can ask ourselves: What are the implications of quantitative easing on inequality? 
because obviously uh, it raises you know the price of uh, financial assets and maybe doesn't you know help a part of uh, the, the, the 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 public or the economy so that's one topic which is not easy to to deal with and has different implications whether you're in the US or whether you're in the Eurozone, for instance. Yes, and certainly also the, the trade-offs and the, ten, the tensions between the long and the short-run investment. So thank you all very much. Uh, it's a challenging decade coming up for central banks, the new investment environment, issues such as climate change, technology coming up on their radars, but also the fundamental challenges of how do we get back into where we were in terms of having the ammunition to, to respond to new crises, um, uh, lowering the balance sheets, getting interest rates back towards normality. So uh, looking forward to seeing and answering all these questions, especially in the context of the euro area that we've been discussing. Thank you very much. Thank you.